uh, that, that it was evident to everyone. Uh, I think what why they were there and what their point of view was. And anyway, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. You know, I said to you earlier, what grieved Paul was that this woman was bound. And that Christianity is all about being free. Here we see that when God came on the scene, he not only set Paul and Silas free, but everybody else around them. They all got free. Makes me think that God's all about people being free. When I read this, it makes me think, you know, Paul and Simon, all they did was pray. And by the way, it doesn't tell us what they prayed. It doesn't have the words. I have a thought. I have an idea. You want to hear my guess? Here's my guess, what they prayed. Oh, God, get us out of here. <laughs> That's my supposition. <laughs> I don't know. What would you pray? <laughs> That's about what I pray. And so what I think, and then said they sang praises. What I think, this is just my little idea, Maybe God, you know, sitting up in heaven, uh, heard heard that, and He says, "Hey, you angels, do you hear what I hear? I hear someone who's uh, who's been beaten and their feet are in socks, but they're singing my praises in the middle of all their trouble. I got to go down and get a better look at this. <laughs> it's so unusual. So God came down on the scenes, and whenever God comes on the scene, everybody gets free. That's what happened. Yeah, they all got free. I think that's the way it is. When God shows up, not people get oppressed, but everybody gets free. I think He's all about us being free." That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah, so they all were free. But think about this from the point of view of the jailer. <laughs> you know, we look at it from one point of view, yay, hurrah, but uh, like that woman who got free, but her masters are not. Well, the jailer now, they're all, all of his charges are free. The keeper of the prison, waking out of sleep, seeing the prison doors open, <coughs> he saw that the doors are now thrown open. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled. Now the reason he did that is because if the Romans, see he works for the Romans, they were the governing authority, and they didn't look too kindly on things like this, think people going wrong, and if, if they found out that he'd let all his prisoners free, he, he probably couldn't tell them, well God came and set everybody free. Oh yeah, sure he did. <laughs> they wouldn't take that as a, a good explanation, probably. So. The Romans would have most likely made a terrible example out of him, so that everybody in the future would say, "Boy, I better, I better keep my prisoners, because look what happened to him." So he drew out his sword and was going to kill himself. Now I don't know if you've ever been in your life close to death, but it makes you think seriously about things. You know, uh, if you've ever been in a, in a, in a very s terrible situation and, and thought that you might die, it, it does sober you up right away. And I think that's what happened with this man. And I think this jailer knew why Paul and Silas were in prison. I think he heard the story. I'm just guessing. He probably asked around, what are these guys doing here? Well, uh, they were, this woman followed them around and said, these are the servants of the Most High God who showed to us the way of salvation. Oh, so that's who they are. He, I think he must have heard something like that. I'm just guessing. Because here's what he says. Oh, Paul, verse 28. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. In other words, we haven't run away. We're all here. So this guy was just on the point of killing himself, and Paul stopped him just at the last minute. He's, you know, he's very sober-minded here. Uh, he called for a light, the jailer did, and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Why is he trembling? He, well, he's about to die, he thought. He was just about to kill himself, and Paul stopped him at the last minute. And so in this frame of mind, thinking about uh, his own life and uh, coming to the end of his life, almost, he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, this is interesting. Why did he ask him that question? Again, I think, remember what the woman said? These are servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. Evidently, I'm supposing he must have heard about that. And so, if these men know the way of salvation, what does that mean? To, he, it says, what, uh, what must I do to be saved? These men are servants of the Most High God. In other words, how do I, how do I make myself acceptable to this Most High God? What is this way of salvation? Tell it to me. You know, what must I do to be saved? That's what he's saying. Now again, if you were to ask this question, just go around and asking people at random, you're going to get all kinds of answers. Just stop people on the street. What do I have to do to be saved? Some people say, well, sit down and get comfortable because it's going to take me a long time to explain it. <laughs> it's very complicated. Some people are going to say, it's a long list, and when you get done with that, i got more things for you to do. <laughs> right? Now, Paul didn't say any of those things. 
In fact, what Paul said was so simple. What Paul said was so plain, a child could have preached this message. He could say it in one sentence. Although Paul, we know from reading elsewhere, he could be very long-winded. Uh, we read at one time Paul was preaching and he preached on through the night. And he preached so long that a, a young man said, fell asleep <laughs> and fell out of a window. <laughs> fell down to the ground and died. And Paul had, went prayed for him and he came back to life. That's a good, that's a good thing. But he could be long-winded. But he could also see the essence of the message. The answer, the answer to the question is so simple and so short. He could preach it in one breath. The, the, the fundamental answer. So when this man says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Before I read it, don't you think that he deserves an honest answer? Don't you? Is it a good question? Is it a fair question? You don't think Paul would toy with him, do you? You don't think Paul would give him an incomplete or false answer, do you? He asked a simple question. Paul owed it to him to give him a complete and, and proper answer. So here's what Paul says, verse 31. And they said, that's Paul and Silas, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, if there was more, and there's a period. Uh, if there was more to it, if there were more requirements, he should have told him. Right? Should he not have at that point? Yeah. He should have said, well, that's just the beginning. That's what some people say. I've heard that a lot. That's just the beginning. That's not just the beginning. That's the whole thing. Now, there's more to your life. There's growth as a Christian, but that's it. That's the answer to the question. Well, in other words, what must I do to be in right relationship with the Almighty God? Uh, like that woman said, these men, servants of the Most High God. What must I do? Well, here's what you must do. Put your faith in. That's what it means to believe. Believe in, to trust in, to rely on Jesus. That's all. That's all. <clears throat> now, there's more. There's more things we do. There's more you know, things to know. There's more ways that we grow. There's more practical information. But in essence, that's it. Now, uh, in talking about this with people who have that other point of view, the one that has a long list of things to do and you never quite get there, I've had those conversations with people like that, and it makes them very unhappy. I, I, to me, I think this is good news. I like this, by the way. Having been on the other side of it, having been uh, in church environments where, where you're made to feel like you never can, you're never quite right, God's not quite ever happy with you. you know? He's never, you're never quite good enough. There's always some reason you should feel... Uh, uh, condemned or ashamed or, or not quite right with God. I, to me, I think this is good news. But I remember having a conversation with uh, a particular man, uh, and I'm not just making these up. This is really true, and I can tell you where it was out there. You know, uh, at the end of, at the West End, had a, what's that little convenience store, Lightning Night? You know what that is? Uh, he wanted to meet me there for a coke, and he wanted to have a discussion. And he was upset about this idea. But that's about just believe faith in Christ is the only thing necessary. Well, he said, well, that's not why. I think all these other things. He had a long list of things. And so I quoted this to him. I think this is pretty plain. He said, here's his answer. Well, so that's just the Apostle Paul. That's just Paul's opinion. Jesus had a different opinion. Well, okay. <clears throat> Did Jesus have a different opinion? Well, let's look in John's Gospel, chapter 6. And I just want you to see something here. And draw something to your attention. This is in John's Gospel, chapter 6. And this is after a miraculous event in the ministry of Jesus when there was this multitude. I think we read this last week, as a matter of fact. Uh, a multitude, and uh, there was a lack. They didn't have enough food to feed them. And Jesus said, what do you have? And we have these fish and these loaves of bread. But that's so small. Uh, he said, bring them to me. And Jesus blessed the bread and blessed the fish. And said, now hand it out to the people to eat. And as they handed it out, somehow it was enough to feed everybody. And they had 12 baskets full left over. Well, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? It was a miracle. Nobody could figure that out. And so uh, then the people, uh, let's see, Jesus went up in a mountain to pray, and, um, and the people went away, and the disciples sailed across this little water in a ship. And then they come around to the other side of the water, and then the people came and found him there. And here's verse 26. John chapter 6, verse 26. <clears throat> and they found Jesus, and Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. What is he saying? He said, you're seeking me because you want another meal. <laughs> he said, there's, there's, there's more important things than just getting another free meal. And then he says, verse 27, labor, that's work, by the way, labor not for the meat which perishes, in other words, for temporal things, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. Notice the contrast between work